microphones first and foremost. Testies. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Thank you guys so much for being here. How's the weekend been so far for you guys? Fabulous. Awesome. Good. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, this is so exciting. So uh, we got some questions, and then we're going to throw things to the audience. But I, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, congratulations on the franchise and, uh, you know, being a huge part of the horror community. I want to know, what do you think it is about the Hatchet franchise that sets it apart from other horror films? Well, I think um, the timing of the first one, because uh, the script went around in 2004, and everybody in town passed on it because of, like, it got me a lot of work, like writing work, and the response was always, we really like the writing, but this will never get made because, uh, well, the famous story that a lot of people know um, from a major studio, which I won't say who, mm. um, Come on. Universal Studios. <laughs> said that uh, this will never get made because it's not a remake, it's not a sequel, and it's not based on a Japanese one. <laughs> and so I made that the tagline on the poster when it did festivals, and then could not get a meeting at Universal for like six years after that. <laughs> but that was exactly why we wanted it, because if you remember way back in the mid-2000s, everything was a remake, a sequel, a remake of a Japanese movie, or PG-13. And I was like, I really was just sick of the mean-spiritedness, like the torture porn and stuff. Like, it should all exist, and I like all of it. But for me personally, I always liked, you know, Freddy and Michael Myers and Jason and Leatherface, and like, they were, they were fun, even though they were violent and sometimes scary, but they were fun. And so I was trying to just bring that back again to the stuff that I grew up on. So we made it independently, and I screened it for my talent agency at the time. They passed on repping it because they said, uh, we represent film festival movies. This is not a film festival movie. And then it got into Tribeca. And I'm like, I think this could be a franchise. And they're like, it'll never happen. Um, so every step has just been from people telling me no. And like, that's probably the best way to get a product out of me, tell me no, and then I have to do it just to be right. So, um, but it was born in the conventions. For anybody who remembers way back then, uh, I know this is a very young crowd, but we're, well, Ken and I are old. Um, and, <laughs> but we would go and we would show the clip from the first one of Mrs. Primatio running away and Kane ripping her head in half. And the audience would, there were some conventions we'd have to show it a second time because the audience would demand to see it again. But I would just tell my story. And, but I was like, convention, convention, convention. And I've been saying ever since then, why aren't more of the newer filmmakers here? Why aren't they doing that? Like, these are our people. These are who we make it for. And then finally, Damien and David from Terrifier, you saw them doing it for the last like three years. <coughs> And everyone had missed the first Terrifier. But then the second one comes out and fucking <coughs> boom, which is so fucking great to see. Woo! So, um, I mean, slashers will never die if they're made, I think, from the right, I guess, point of view or whatever, if they're made with love. And that's, I know people get frustrated because it's so many years between Hatchet movies, but we only do it when we're ready to do it. And it's the same people who do each one. And I think that's why the franchise has held up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so for Danielle and Kane, I wanted to know what was it like working with Adam as a director? Adam's a pain in the ass. <laughs> I, I second that. We love him, but he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. No, I, we love Adam. Are you kidding? We do so much shit for, for at all. Anytime Adam calls, I'm like, oh god. God, yes, Adam, what do you need? What are we doing? What am I going to be having to do? Are we having to make out again? Are you <laughs> sticking me in the water? Am I going to get cheers on my ass? What's happening? <laughs> but we gladly do it and show up. I mean, that's honestly, that's what the greatest thing for me doing horror is 99.9% .9 of the directors are horror fans. You know, they're, they're fanboys or girls. 
So it's nice to have people that really know it and love it behind the camera. I mean, it's great. I mean, the only thing that was like, you guys put, he put me through hell because he didn't cast me in the first one, even though I auditioned for it and then came back for the second one and I didn't have an opportunity to like ramp up like most actors do. You normally start somewhere and then you build up and then something happens and then you become the final girl and have to fight the bad guy. I just sort of like started day one in the water, literally, with all of Kuma's poop and <laughs> disgustingness, and oh yeah, oh my god, it's not pretty and pleasurable. I mean, I've never, I remember like even the, I think it was the opening of, I think it was three, where, I think it might have been one of the first days too, and it was you and Pentagraft, and it was when I was, you know, hatcheting his head open. You guys had those like um, pressure cannon things for the blood, <laughs> And the camera was pointing up at me and they were down and holding this and it was just on me and it was, they just went to town. It was, I mean, I was choking. I had so much blood, I was choking to death. And see how he's laughing right now? It's so funny. <laughs> That's exactly what's happening and they're like, okay, cut, and everybody's high-fiving and laughing, running around and I'm, I'm just standing there, fucking drenched in it. So there's a lot of like, oh crap, I forgot I'm making a movie, it's, this is so much fun, that effect was so great, but. I mean, that's why we do it. Yeah, there was, there was a very important, for anyone who doesn't know the whole story, so Danielle auditioned for the first one, and when she walked in, of course I knew who she was, and I'm like, holy shit, it's Jamie Lloyd, this is awesome. <laughs> um, but at that point, because Mary Beth was the last person I cast, and there were already so many like horror stars in the movie, there was like, obviously Kane was like the very first to get involved. But then, like, Robert England was going to be in it, and Tony Tom was going to be in it, Josh Leonard from Blair Witch Project, and Mercedes McNabb from uh, Buffy, and even John Beekler doing the effects and his legacy. And I was worried, because the movie's also funny, that people would think it's like a spoof of horror movies if I had one more horror legend. So we went back and forth, and ultimately I went with an unknown named Tamara Feldman, who was great. But then when the sequel happened and the first one had become a big success, she took like some really bad advice from agents who thought like now she was this huge star. Um, and it just wasn't gonna work out. And I'm like, now what do I do? Because I, I remember you called me, I was shooting Stakeland in upstate New York. And you're like, hi. Um so yeah, um I know I didn't cast you, but um, <laughs> I would love to. Well, no. So, <laughs> I've never had to eat more shit on a phone call. And she goes, yeah, she goes, admit you were wrong. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I was wrong. <laughs> but, but it was also my first opportunity. He gave me my first opportunity of being a lead in a, in a horror franchise again. I mean, I really, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't have a huge part in the Rob's Halloweens. I mean, this is really the biggest character and the most like acting flexing I've been able to do since Halloween four and five. And the position I was in, it's like, what do I do now? Because there were three movies planned from the get go. We even showed the weapons he was gonna use in two. When you go back and watch part one, you see the big chainsaw behind Mary Beth and the Barth. Like it was all planned out. Um, even down to the fact that Victor Crowley is half black, like that's why his hair is the way it was. So like Kane knew that and John Beekler knew that, but no one else knew the full backstory yet. But now I'm like, do I scrap all that because the actress is gonna have to change? Because nobody likes it when the, you know, some, there's a big change like that, so I'm like... Yeah, but it's me. Right. <laughs> it's and not like, like she's replacing me. She would have been fucked. Right. <laughs> So, you know, the only way this is going to work is if we go to the greatest screen queen of our generation, mm -hmm. and then, because initially my fans are like, wait, the same person's not, oh wait, who is it? <laughs> oh, alright, great. And then it was yeah, just like, boom. Oh. you guys, Wardrobe went and got her clothes out of storage from the wardrobe. I mean, she's way taller than me. She's taller and skinnier, and they were like, disgusting still. Like, crunchy, gross. We forgot to wash them. <laughs> I'm like, you guys, I can't, I can't put this, like, can we just try to find a copy? I gotta wear her clothes? Come on. So we, we finessed it. Uh, Kate, what was it like for you the first time that you 
had everything put on and you looked at yourself in the mirror before going to set? Um, well, I mean, first of all, it was an amazing process just working with Adam from the beginning. And, you know, you play a character like Jason, who has had six films before uh, I ever started. So, it, you know, I kind of didn't want to discount what had been done, but I still wanted to kind of make it my own. But working with Adam and the Victor character, you know, we could, I could have a lot of input as to character traits and stuff like that. And, you know, nobody has seen the character. So it was really enjoyable to develop that from the beginning. And when I first read the script and, <clears throat> you know, I see, I'm going to grab a woman from behind and rip her head apart by her jaw. I said, boy, that's for me. Um, <laughs> I didn't think anybody would be as fucked up in the head as I am, but Adam beats me. Um, not, not literally, but... Um, <clears throat> and, you know, then we did some makeup tests, and, you know, I saw sketches of the makeup, what we were hoping to do, and I thought it looked pretty terrifying. And, you know, it, it's a long makeup process, three and a half hours of putting the stuff on every day before you start shooting, most people's work day is almost halfway done. And mine hadn't even started by the time I was ready to get on camera. But the, the makeup looks so good and so terrifying that it was really fun to be a part of something like that from the beginning. And then you, when you see that there's such an abrupt end to the film, the first one, that is something that most people can't pull off. This is a new franchise. Everybody thinks they're going to do more than one. And most of the time it doesn't happen. But for Adam to have the confidence that he could abruptly end it without really um, coming to a conclusion in the first one because he wanted to pick up the second movie from that moment, I thought was incredibly uh, risky, but it showed me how much dedication he had to the, the story and the character, and I just think it was a brilliant way to do those first three films like that. And, and I, I know I asked you this before, but I don't remember, did you always, have the idea of having Perry Shen in every film from the beginning? Once we were halfway through shooting the first one and he had said, my brother hooked me up with this job, I was like, I'm gonna bring him back as the brother. We'll just put some facial hair on. Because Perry Shen, as a, I don't know if any of you guys have ever gotten to meet him at a con. He's on General Hospital, so he doesn't get to do that many cons. But he is like one of the greatest human beings you could ever meet, and he makes every set better, and he's just so professional. And the night before we started filming Hatchet One, he had his daughter was born. And so the rest of us were like, I think we were like 30, most of us, and a lot of the cast was like 21, 22. So it was like a giant party. Not for me, because my heart's in my throat, and I'm like sick, and I'm like, I'm, I didn't make my day, and I got the shots, and the fuck. Um, but the cast was partying all day long and then we would shoot all night and Perry would have to go home and take care of a newborn and this is, I'm sort of going on a tangent here, but when I wrote the sequel, I'm like, I named the character after your daughter and he's like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, her name's Avery and then he reads the script and he calls me back and he's like, so, um, does she have to be getting fucked from behind by a headless corpse? <laughs> And I'm like, oh yeah, oh that happens too. Um, he's like, I'm gonna have to wait a bit to show her this one and tell her she's named after. Um, but then when we were doing the second one, it was like, I, he had to die, of course, but I'm like, I'm just gonna bring him back and just make it a joke where someone says, like, it kind of looks like, oh, we all look the same, don't we? But, um, so obviously, Andrew, his character in Hatchet 3, is the survivor. It's almost like 
he's learning through the movies, even though he's different characters, like how to survive one of these, like fucking hide. Like Marcus has the right idea on the first one, climb a tree, at least you'll see him coming. Um, but uh, if you, all right, for those who don't know, in the fourth movie, his character's promoting a book called I Survivor. And it's a big story point in the film that he's like doing autograph signings for his book even though a ghostwriter was assigned to him and there might be some stuff in it that isn't true and he gets called out on that in the film. So we actually did write the book. Um, I think there's three left at my table right now. You can buy it on Amazon, it's an audio book as well. But I was like, how cool would it be if fans could actually own that book and it's a yes. real book and it's his autobiography and it fills in everything that happened between Hatchet 3 and 4. So you see what happened in those 10 years and it might set up things to come. And so on the tour, you can get the hardcover version. Everyone bought the book, and the book is sold really well, but every time people bring it to my table, and I'm like, so what did you think? They're like, what? Like, what, the book? They're like, oh, I didn't read it. <laughs> Why? They're like, eh, reading. <laughs> there's a, we even printed it really big. And I'm like, there's, a, there's an audio book. Uh, can you just tell me? And I'm like, no. I wrote the book twice because I didn't think it was good enough the first time. So I scrapped it and wrote it again. I, I cared so much about this book and so many of you guys own it and never read it. Like, oh no, I just put it on my shelf. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you think, or how much time do you spend thinking about creative ways to kill people? Um, if I'm like at a supermarket or a <laughs> I figured you have to get it like they randomly pop into your head. Yeah, watching the news. Yeah, um, yeah I just get so angry. And then I, um, the, the thing is like, okay, so a lot of people are so disappointed when they first met me, like before Austin was out and people knew what I looked like, because they'd see the movies and then they'd come and I, usually my dog is with me and like my fucking Yankee candles and, my, and they're like, you're the, you're the guy? Yeah. Like, oh, do you have any tattoos? No. Like, but they're expecting like Rob Zombie and then they get this, you know, so. <laughs> great. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how I come up with such violent stuff, but to me it's, it's funny because it's not realistic. I don't really like realistic um, stuff. I do it sometimes like Frozen or Spiral, like more serious stuff, but I just think of like what haven't I seen or what have I seen that, that I think could go further. And then I usually run it by Kane and the effects team. The effects team immediately says no. Cause like the rule is it has to be practical. Like I don't want to do CG kills. We can like remove a cable or something like that, but no CG kills. So in two, the chainsaw up through two guys at the same time, I'm like, I've never seen that. That could be really funny. And um, initially Pentagraph was like, there's no way to do this. Like there's no way. And then a week later, after he had like quit three times and come back, he's like, <laughs> all right, I think I figured it out. And so that kill, um, oh, which by the way, we're gonna show you guys something really interesting. Um, okay, so that kill, the chainsaw, it's a redwood chainsaw, it weighs 125 pounds. So even Kane can't carry that, like it's impossible. So there's two other dudes who have it on a cable that's running through the top of the stage and they're walking with Kane. The blade is obviously put in in post because you can't, unfortunately, put a spinning chainsaw blade between two actors' legs. Oh. Fucking rules. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the two actors have to be flown in harnesses so that they'll lift up with the blade at just the right time. And then you need the dummies that are going to come apart on the PVC pipe once you cut behind it. And you really only get one shot at it, and the blood is spraying all over can, it's spraying everywhere. I mean, we destroyed that sound stage, it was so awesome. That was a bunch of And um, and it worked, but they only had a female harness for Colton Dunn. Do you remember this? And like the amount of pain that he was in. The same thing happened to Sean Ashmore for some reason on Frozen. And um, he was in so much pain, so like the screaming and stuff, it's all real. Um, so, but then we added the testicles rolling down because we knew we needed to give the MPAA something to go after. <laughs> and I'm like, so they'll, they'll get all upset about that and we'll cut it, but then the balls are gonna come back and hatch it three. And they're like, stop it. No, they're not. I'm like, no, 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 trust me, it's gonna be really funny. There's gonna be balls hanging from a tree. And everyone's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> um, and then in three, uh, 
it was, so the police go in first and came, kills them all, and then the SWAT team shows up. And it's described in the script as a forest of gore. So there were supposed to be intestines and body parts and stuff, and that's where the balls were gonna come into it. <laughs> this is such a stupid conversation. That's where the balls were gonna come into it. And, um, and so it took six hours and like a ton of the budget to create the forest of gore. The crew, so for all my stuff, the crew shirts are always takes on concert shirts. So for Hatchet 3, it was like the Slayer logo. And then on the back, it lists all the shoot dates at like as if they're tour spots. So um, it says Forest of Gore. That was the title of the tour. And right before we started shooting, it wasn't a hurricane, but like this massive tropical storm came through and washed away our whole set. So all of it was gone. And so all we had left were the balls. <laughs> and that's why in the movie, when Cody Snyder was like, these motherfucking some of these balls hang for trees. Balls are not supposed to be hanging for trees. Um, it worked, but it was supposed to be this, this crazy thing, and you never got to see it. While we're talking about this, so what I wanted to show you guys, but sorry, I know these are like weird tangents. A lot of people discovered the Hatchet movies later. They didn't see them in theaters. Hatchet 2 famously got yanked from all theaters which is, a, that would be a whole panel in of itself. Mm -hmm. But they fuck with these movies so hard, and I don't know why, because they're harmless. So when the first one came out, and it got an NC-17, I was devastated, and we went back and forth, I want to say 11 or 12 times, cutting stuff out, but they were changing the tone of the movie. They were actually making it worse, mm -hmm. like making it more serious because there's a difference between going too far where that's funny and then keeping it realistic. So, uh, on streaming, Amazon, um, I think whenever they were on maybe Hulu or something, they don't tell you that you're seeing a censored version. You don't know that. So a lot of people are seeing these films for the first time and they don't even realize they're not seeing the actual movie. So like when the first one, so I famously um, went to trial over the first one thinking I could beat them. And there's no, it's a, you can't win. But I thought I could. And because I thought I had a good point. I'm like, right now everything's torture and it's mean spirited and depraved. No one even smokes a cigarette in the first Hatchet movie. There's no sex. Nothing in this is realistic. It's a bunch of comedians. The blood is like Monty Python. I'm like, why are you being so hard on this one? And it was because it was independent. And so there's a documentary called This Film Has Not Yet Been Rated by Kirby Dick. If you ever get a chance, watch it. Those are the exact people I faced off with. So I go to the trial. It's supposed to be 12 industry professionals who are just there to watch the movie and decide were you treated fairly. Not to rate it, just were you treated fairly. And they walked in 12 senior citizens. One dude was in a walker. And like the screen is here. It's like looking there. And they said, um, the film you're about to watch is called Hatchet. And they all go, ugh. Yeah. And I'm like, still, I'm like, I've got this. And uh, they played the movie. And I'd seen it all over the world at this point, in every country. And there's certain jokes that didn't matter if you spoke the language or not, people laugh. And I think the joke they didn't laugh at was um, when Richard really says, oh, you're making a movie. And Joel Murray goes, oh, you ever hear of uh, Bayou Beavers? And Richard Gilly goes, sure, no. Um, no one laughed. And from the back of the theater, I went, come on! <laughs> and so then I got 15 minutes to make my case. Joan Graves, who was the head of the MPAA, gave her case. And I used as examples, I used um, Saw, Hostel, and the remake of The Hills of Eyes. And especially the remake of The Hills of Eyes. I'm like, listen, look, this scene, they rape the mother suck on her breast until she lactates into the, the bad guy's mouth. They bite the head off the family parakeet, drink its blood, and run away with the baby that they're gonna eat while dad is crucified and on fire outside. And no one in that theater is laughing. And you guys gave that an R. But this, with a gas-powered belt sander, which doesn't exist in real life, and a undead swamp ghost, like, how is this fair? And I'm like, I did it. And then Joan Gray stands up and goes, has anyone in here seen the films that Mr. Green just referenced? And they all, of course, say no. And then she goes, those are stricken from the record. Oh, what? They even banned the poster, the black poster that's just the hatchet blade, and said it's pornographic. Like, 
So I had to change everything. So when that movie opened in theaters, that opening night, it was so exciting to go to the Arclight Theater in Hollywood and buy a ticket. Like, we did it, we're in theaters. And then watch this movie play that had like nothing left in it. And so with Hatchet 2, I'm like, don't, let's not put this in theaters. I just wanna go straight to video so I can do what I want. And Dark Sky was like, absolutely. So I fucking went for it. And then all of a sudden they're like, we've got great news. Movie's gonna be in theaters. So I'm like, oh, no. But they're like, no, 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 it's good. AMC has just started this new thing called AMC Independent. It doesn't need a rating. So it's gonna play in major multiplexes. That'll be the first time since George Romero's Dawn of the Dead that a horror movie plays without a rating. And I was like, oh my God, I finally win. This is great. Well, uh, when you do press, they bank the interviews. Sometimes they'll do the interview a month in advance. All of a sudden, the week that Hatchet 2 is coming out, we get word from AMC, stop talking about the rating. Now, if you've ever seen a trailer for Hatchet 2, it's like, buckets and buckets of blood, like gore, like you've never seen. And the whole thing was that it was unrated. And I'm like, what? what? And I like, just stop. If, they, if the journalist asks, we're gonna jump in, there's a publicist from AMC on the phone, a publicist in Dark Sky, and they'd be like, so this is exciting that the movie's coming out with that, and they'd both be like, no, 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 we're, just, we're not talking about that. So I knew something was amiss. And then uh, Entertainment Weekly ran a story. <laughs> there's a picture of me with duct tape over my mouth, and it says, Adam Green calls the MPAA evil. And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> I had done that interview a month before, and I had told this whole story. So Hatchet 2 opened on Friday night. Danielle was in, I think you were in New York. Kane, you were, were you here in Florida? Or you were somewhere. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. I was in LA, Tony Todd was in, I think, Chicago. Like, those midnight screenings alone, if that was it, it would have already done well. And then on Saturday, gone. It just wasn't there anymore. And on, I think it was like still MySpace and Twitter back then. And people are like, I just went to my theater, it's not there. Like, and we have no idea what's going on. But they pulled it from all screens. And then somebody from, from AMC said, oh, it wasn't performing. That's not a thing. Movies don't get pulled, like, have you ever heard of Waterworld? <laughs> <laughs> but those are real bombs. And a movie yeah. opened that same weekend called Chain Letter, a horror movie that made $32 per screen and stayed for two weeks. So um, it was devastating and I couldn't say anything. My lawyers are like, you're gonna make other movies, you gotta work with the studio system, let other people have this argument now. And I just sit there and watch while people are like, Adam Green pulled his own movie from theaters as a stunt to publicize. Like it's, I love that people think I'm that powerful, but it's not. Um, but the R-rated version of Hatchet 2, which is what most people see when you stream it instead of buying the Blu-ray, um, or seeing it on a place like Screenbox or Shutter, where they make sure that you're seeing the real version. This is what happens. I hope we really do have this clip, but I didn't just set yes, up for we, two minutes. We do have the clip, correct? Okay, that was so all first you're gonna see the R-rated version, which is what the MPAA wanted you to see, and then you're gonna see the real version. Now for some of you, this might be the first time you even see the real version based on where you streamed the film. Um, mm. But you'll see they changed the whole tone of it because hitting somebody in the mouth with a hatchet three times is kind of fucked up but hitting him 30 times is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful what you stream, because they don't tell you. Um, because I've been making us think about this, I've noticed that Amazon now will say R-rated version. Um, so you still would have to know, though, that there is an unrated one. Um, but they make you, I think, pay a dollar to see the unrated one. Um, in Victor Crowley, there's the bookstore scene where a dude whips out his dick and asks Andy Young to sign it. That was a very, it was, it was more than a joke to me because it was a commentary that it's always gratuitous female nudity. So I'm like, I'm gonna do gratuitous male nudity. Yeah. Yeah. And throughout the tour, women thanked me afterwards for doing that. They're like, you know, it's about time. And then the movie comes out and they, again, they didn't say unrated or rated. And there were reasons for that because if it's unrated, you can't be on the front page of new releases on iTunes or Apple or whatever it was. So they just didn't say anything. And they don't show the dick. Now, did you have a casting session for the dick? We did. <laughs> and Who it was the dick? awkward. Um, Sarah. It was odd that it was like a three week 
casting session. Oh. I don't know if that was necessary, was it? We, oh man, we notoriously have bad luck with nudity. Um, I can't tell this story, I'll get canceled. Um, okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't. I can't. Come to my table, I'll tell you about it. But I do um, okay. Uh, but I said, fine, if you're gonna cut the dick, you have to cut the, the boobs out as well. I'm like, you can't. And they're like, no, no, the boobs are fine. I'm like, uh, yeah, I know, you have to cut that too. And they did, in Dark Sky's defense. And they listened to me, and so when you see that version, it's just framed above the girl lifting her shirt. When she says, can you, can you sign one of them to my dad? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, but the dick was cut out, and then there were women that wrote to me on um, social media that were like, I'm really disappointed that you backed down. And I'm like, it's not me, it's not my fault, but I'm not allowed to say that because it's interfering with business, and I could get sued, so I can't say any of this stuff. Now it's been enough years, no one's gonna care. Mm. But, so, point is though, be careful what you stream, because sometimes you might not be seeing the actual movie. Thank you for showing that to us. I mean, the cane, of course, you're brilliant. That was, thank you. That was amazing. That was an exhausting scene, by the way. <laughs> Whether it's a fake action or not, swinging it that many times, and that was one take, oh my that uh, I got pretty cranky. <laughs> so the next scene was extra violent, but. I don't think people realize how tough they actually are. Like, maybe with cane, you do. But Danielle, man, in Hatchet 3, some of the shit she had to do, being hung from that tree at the end with the impalement, and then when they were letting you down and they like dropped you, and she's getting eaten alive by ants the whole time, too. Like, somebody went to the emergency room every night of Hatchet 3. Kane had to go one night, he like stopped breathing from the bus. He drove himself to the emergency room. And he drove himself. <laughs> That's how much of a badass he is. Like, we'll, we'll take you to the hospital. He's like, I'll drive. <laughs> so we have about 10 minutes. Should we try to take a couple questions from the crowd? All right, now is your opportunity. Whatever questions, clearly nothing is off limits here today. So, uh, all right. First victim, what's your name? What's your question? Hello. So I have one unserious question, but then a serious question. So, Adam, is it Market Basket or Market yeah. Basket? <laughs> It's market baskets. Market, market bas baskets. Market, market basket. <laughs> yes. Somebody made me a, I'm wearing it right now. Uh, someone gave me this on Friday. It's a market basket uh, bracelet that says market basket on it. So thank you if you're in here. Remember to do this. And I like the shirt. I have my new bird comic bag with me. So. Yes. Love it. Uh, so my serious question, because I, I love Holliston, obviously. My favorite is the Holliston Hop Goblin episode. I love that episode. Uh, but We're, what so are We're so wasted. We're so wasted. Wait, why do I have to be the slut? I love that. Um, but what are uh, your guys' favorite episodes, whether it's going back and watching them or just from on the set memories? Because you're all incredible on the show. Oh my god, he's in the bed. It's so weird. It's too weird. <laughs> I think that will forever be one of the, the funniest moments of my life. Absolutely. Like, when I wrote that, and that's the benefit to being able to write parts for your friends. Like, I knew that they would find it as funny as I did. And the fact that these guys, uh, and, and like Tony Todd and, and um, Sid, and that, like, that they play such messed up versions of themselves, because there's some actors that are way too pretentious to do that. But that Danielle's like using me to get my Vicodin in, and then <laughs> going to the dentist to get teeth pulled, because I think she's gonna date me. Oh, thanks, um, boo. Yeah. <laughs> um, but shooting that scene, was so when she walks out in the, in the clown costume, but then when Kane runs in and just sees what's going on and is like, oh yeah, and then in the script it said Kane lists a bunch of other horror celebrities that they've done this with before, and then he made he came up with a list, and the fact that Angus Scrim was on the bottom of this orgy, like the oldest man, like. And for anyone who got to meet Angus while well, he was still here with us, just the sweetest guy. And that he was involved in these orgies that happened at conventions. But, but to have a threesome between myself wearing that SM Michael Myers mask, which somebody cosplayed as yesterday, which was amazing no. to see. 
and they did such a good job with it too. I have the original in my office, but with Danielle like beating me up, slapping me, and like banging my head against the headboard, but then Kane on the bed too, and like, um, and even like continuing it out into the apartment when Joe hits me with the frying pan and the whole like that. As a horror fan, like that was like the funniest thing I'd ever seen, let alone be involved in. But also too, there's so much about that. Like Danielle's willingness to make fun of herself like that. Again, like a lot of people, they just, they just wouldn't, you know? And then for the Freddy versus Jason joke with, with Kane. Yes. But it's like, once you make this joke, because that was a fucked up situation, like in real life. But once you make this joke, you own it now. You control that situation, and it can never hurt you again. You know, and he, but he got that, and, and then owned it, and went for it, and it's so fucking funny every time he starts like, you know, spazzing out, and he also cut his own head open. Um, it's candy glass, when you hit yourself with it, and the second take, he sliced his, Head open, and once again, we're like, shit, he probably should go to the emergency room. And he goes, just give me some super glue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's roll. And everyone's like, did he just? I'm like, yeah, he did. Just, just go. Just shoot. Great question. All right, well, thank you guys. Yes, I would still love to see shin pads. I would love to see shin pads. Oh. But if we ever did it, it would never live up to what you guys have in your mind. So the whole, we were never the plan was that we were never gonna actually, something would always go wrong where the audience wouldn't get to see it. But in France, these guys made it. It's called Goal of the Dead. I, I don't know, I'm sure you can find it somewhere. But it's Shin Pads, the, the real movie. I'm gonna look for that, yeah. thank you guys. All right, we have time for just one more question. Sure. Right. No, you're fine. Hello. Hi. Um, so I know Kane was talking a lot about this uh, prior, like how he loves like really like gnarly kills and stuff. But uh, out of all three of you, like even if it's not a movie you're in, what are your favorite kills of all time in any film you've seen? The least amount of horror movies here between the two of you guys. Uh, okay, if it's not one of my own, I still think the sleeping bag. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, the first time I saw that, um, that, I think that was the first Friday the 13th movie that I saw in a theater on like opening weekend because I, I was young. Um, and I was more concerned, yeah, but, well that doesn't matter. But uh, <laughs> when the fact that she starts like trying to hide in her sleeping bag and he just lifted up and smacked her and I was laughing for the next like 20 minutes. Like, it was, and, and then when showing friends at sleepovers, be like, you gotta see this, you gotta see it. Just waiting for that moment, knowing it like, it, like, if you've ever gotten the chance to see part seven in a theater, like everyone's waiting for it. And then this, um, just a rupture of laughter and cheers when it happens. And there's like this simple innocentness to it. Um, but, yeah. Have you ever seen anyone? I saw someone at a show a couple months ago dressed oh, in that, sure. carrying the sleeping bag around. Yes, there have been a couple of times we've done photo ops and somebody brings the yellow sleeping bag in. And so good. I think that's pretty creative. That's still my favorite Jason Kill, followed by Frozen Head. Yes. And punching the guy's head off. Uh, and Jason takes Manhattan. But uh, mm -hmm. all time favorite kill that I've ever done is ripping the lady's head apart. Yeah. Yeah. This is for Matteo and, you know, we had one take. I know you've probably heard me tell it before, but Adam was so concerned because there was a, a 360 camera move before the camera would get back into position for me to rip the head apart. He was worried that I was going to do it too soon and, uh, we wouldn't catch it on film, but worked out perfectly. And when I saw it, I cheered in the theater, and people are like, "Yeah, that's fucked up." <laughs> <laughs> He's not quite right, is he? Okay, circle of trust. Nobody runs on the internet. I mean, print this, please.